Alex Steele. Welcome to Bloomberg Commodities Edge. We focus on the companies, the physical assets, and the trading behind the hottest commodities with the smartest voices in the business. Let's get right to the data dig where we look at the top market stories of the week and the year. So we got to start with Bitcoin, the world's largest digital currency, now vaulted above 29,000 on the final day of trading in 2020. Another record high is almost advanced about 50 percent so far in December, on track for its biggest monthly gain since May of 2019. We also had a pretty bullish U.S. oil inventory report this week. Stockpiles falling a whopping 1.6 million barrels. That's twice as much as expected, uh, basically due to the Pad 3. Now, that's just one supportive data point. Remember, though, crude is still down like 20 percent uh, overall this year. And here is a flying stock that's not Apple. A copper miner, Freeport McMoran Copper and Gold, pushing its year-to-date gain to nearly 100 percent. That's close to joining a group of S&P 500 stocks that have at least doubled in price during 2020. And that's as the underlying metal also had a killer year. So let's stay with copper and get into the ring. The metal now poised to top annual gains for base metals in 2020. Joining me now with the analysis of Bloomberg Intelligence Mining Analyst Andrew Cosgrove. Andrew, a lot of analysts are bullish on copper in 2021. What is your call? Hi, Alex. Thanks for having me. Um, you know, I know sometimes it pays uh, to go against the consensus, but we are going to ride with consensus into next year. Um, I think copper prices will end up higher than where they start at the end of 2021 for a variety of reasons. Firstly, on the physical side, we see some of the biggest deficits that we've witnessed in the last 10 years developing next year. And they, that even assumed some decent demand growth, not, not even, you know, gangbuster demand growth because the supply side is still very impaired. Notwithstanding the fact that you have all of this stimulus chasing uh, very few real assets or hands that are in real assets as well. Plus, the Chinese really haven't participated in this rally. And those are the main three reasons why we believe copper will be higher next year. And it wasn't just copper, though, that had a killer year. Also, iron ore, for example. I mean, all the metals really exposed to China soared. Which metal do you feel like has the most upside now in 2021? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a tough call. I mean, I'm going to go off the radar and say net coal. Um, it's going to be kind of left for dead. One piece of the net coal market has suffered because China has induced uh, a policy where they've been limiting Australian exports. We think there's going to be a pinch point in the second quarter where you're going to see FOB Australian prices converge with the CFR prices, which come from the rest of the world outside of Australia. And on the other side of that would be, you know, fading iron ore to a certain extent with China coming out just yesterday saying that they want to lower steel production. So that really has some overhead pressure developing for iron ore, whereas net coal, it's pretty much quite the opposite. Great analysis. Andrew, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Bloomberg Intelligence's Andrew Cosgrove. Time now for a commodity in chief, where we delve into one topic and one person in the commodity world. Today, we're going to focus on venture global and U.S. LNG exports. So when people say energy independence, they think it's all about oil, but it's also about natural gas. 1.6 billion cubic feet a day. That is how much LNG the U.S. exported in 2019. That number could reach 14 billion cubic feet a day by 2025. Here's how it works. You got gas that travels from a field. It's cooled down into liquid, loaded onto a tanker, and shipped off. Now, each facility is called a train, and a site can have as many as six or more of these trains. Each one can take up to five years to build and cost billions of dollars. So to get the money, companies sign these long-term contracts with big buyers like India or Total, and they use that cash to fund the development. The problem? Project delays and cost overruns. One solution? Modular trains. You build the trains in an off-site factory while simultaneously working on the nuts and bolts of permitting. When the trains are ready, they're loaded onto a tanker, shipped into the U.S., and plopped down on the coast. Now, projects from scratch can cost over $2,000 a ton. Brownfield projects between $700 and $1,500, while a modular project like this can cost as little as $500 per ton. It can also cut build time by as much as one to two years. Now, one company leading the charge with this is Venture Global, which teamed up with Baker Hughes to build these trains in Italy. It's planning for 50 million tons a year of LNG export capacity on three sites on the U.S. Gulf Coast. So far, Venture Global has six major buyers under 20-year contracts and charges them less than $2 MMBTU. Its competitors charge around $3. 
and it's all because of these cheaper modular trains. If they can make it work, it changes the cost curve of exporting natural gas and will leave some companies' terminal hopes in the trash. I recently spoke to CEO Mike Sable and asked him about the naysayers he's confronted over the years. The reason that we've had a lot of naysayers is the same as you have in any uh, setting where you have a major disruption of incumbents, where we have dramatically lowered the cost. And again, a risk adjusted cost by definition in commodity segment is king. And so we are disintermediating some uh, large uh, uh, players in the market, but ultimately uh, we're delivering a lower uh, electricity cost for customers. We're uh, displacing massive amounts of, of coal production, which obviously is, is good from a, an emission standpoint. How have you changed the cost curve in that if I wanted to start an LNG export terminal today and I wanted to build it out, what's my cost differential now than before you started to be able to deliver on this project? We believe that we've lowered the cost of the liquefaction component of that total cost by more than 30%. And in a commodity market where people fight and, and scrap over single percentage improvements, that's a massive change. That's enormous. Does that mean that some of the projects that are either trying to get funding won't get it now? Um, do things not get built that need to get built? Or do people just have to kind of go back to the drawing board and reconfigure their projects? Well, we think that this, this, this is going to drive change in the industry and already has. We anticipated it and planned for a significant additional growth uh, four or five years ago we made investments in our next our next construction phases that are twice as big as what we're currently constructing and we we see tremendous demand and are very confident that uh that we'll uh sell that out shortly and begin construction we we think that on the on the gulf coast uh for sure you're going to have to pursue um our approach in order to uh, really just get funded and uh, insured. Uh, but we think ultimately the cost the cost will drive it. So you were talking about uh, Placa Mines, which is one, it's your second project. It has for uh, approval and it holds a permit. Um, any updates on uh, contracts, supply deals, FID, how you're moving along with that? Well, we have approved our regulatory approvals for 20 million tons on the Mississippi River and it's Placa Mines LNG. We uh, right now are looking at that as two 10 million ton per annum phases. We think that uh, we will likely have that sold out in the first half of 2021. We believe there's a pretty substantial uh, uh, shortfall of LNG production capacity coming online in the next five to 10 years. And we're well positioned because of the investments we made already uh, to to meet you know, the, the, the U.S. supply portion of that demand. We have binding 20-year uh, contracts for the next phase of Plaquemines complete. And uh, we just have a few more to go before we are at the level where we'll uh, commence construction, full construction on the full 10 million tons. So who are, who are the buyers? Give me some insight into that as best you can. Sure, the, the buyers for uh, Kakshi Pass are Shell and BP. And, and Galp of Portugal, Edison of Italy, and uh, Repsol of Spain, and PG&IG, the national energy company in, in uh, Poland. Uh, and our first customers in Plaquemines have been PG&IG of Poland and uh, EDF of France. Mike, do you still have a lot of naysayers? You know, when you actually uh, deliver and in, in one day uh, place the liquefaction systems on its pads and, and uh, plug it in, to the rest of your process system, it's difficult to say that it hasn't been done when everyone can see that it's been done. And now to our commodity kicker. It's a little nutty because it was peanut butter and jelly's time in 2020. Americans stocked up on the easiest of comfort foods this year, PB&J. You got nut and seed spreads have been a major beneficiary of more at-home eating with the U.S. retail market booming 14% in 2020 to nearly $2.7 billion. I could eat tubs of peanut butter. I mean tubs. All right. And before you go, here's what's on my radar uh, for next week. On Monday, OPEC Plus ministerial uh, meeting will continue. And then Wednesday, we do those oil inventory numbers and the FAO World Food Price Index. Look for any inflationary signs there. That does it for Bloomberg Commodities Edge. Make sure to catch us every Thursday at 1 p.m. New York time, 6 p.m. in London. Happy New Year, guys. See you in 2021. This is Bloomberg.